yesterday, December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. We uh, arrived at my company, M Company, in a barn, and the company commander, Captain, set us down and sort of talked to us. So the next day they took us out into the woods where the uh, men were stationed, and I stood guard that night all alone. About two o'clock in the morning, my shift came on. There was two feet of snow around. All the men were down in their holes. It was quiet. And they said, keep an eye out for German patrols. And he, being a new guy, I was kind of concerned and a little bit shaken, I guess. And uh, all I was thinking was back home and my friends and what they were doing. Then we set sail on a CI, that's a landing craft entry, infantry, which had ladders down the side of the boat. We got over to Omaha Beach, and they put us in the half tracks, the alligator half tracks, and brought us to shore. And of course, we went up where the Omaha Beach where the cliffs are. We're on our way towards St. Lowe. But before we actually got to St. Lowe, the division before us came to a complete halt. They couldn't go any further. The Germans were really giving it to them. They had ordered an airstrike on the German positions. The airstrike came over, of course, but half of that airstrike landed on our division. I had always dug a, show, a, a foxhole when we were going to stop, but my lieutenant came up and told me, don't bother digging because the 87th Division is coming up and they're going to relieve us in 15 minutes. He said, they're coming up. I said, fine. So I picked out a big tree and I stood behind that tree. Well, I just got there a few minutes and all of a sudden we got shelled by German tanks, uh, 88, we had artillery and mortars. And when those shells came in, because we were in the woods, they exploded up above us and all the shrapnel rained down on us. And in the first burst, I got hit and I fell forward on my face. The concussion knocked me down there and I got a piece of shrapnel right in the center of my spine. And the guys saw me laying down. I said, I'm hit, I'm hit. My squad started hollering, aid man, aid man, come here, aid man. And he heard the holler. And after the first barrage, he ran across. He knelt down and started to work on me to cut my clothes up. He gave me a shot of morphine and put a nim on my forehead and a nim on my fanny. And uh, in comes another barrage, a second one. And uh, oh, a lot of guys got hit. Uh, he was still with me. And then the third barrage came in, and uh, after that, the guys, when it stopped, the guys in my squad picked me up, they hollered for a jeep, the jeep drove up, and they put me in the jeep and put my feet up on the place where the windshield was turned down, and uh, I uh, was driven out of that area, and we went down the road, and as we went along, the German mortars would follow our jeep. Uh, if we were here, by the time we got to there, they were shelling right behind us. Uh, you're clo closer than any brother you, you, you would ever have. Because really, uh, when you say you depend on uh, your buddy for, for your life, it is, it, it's really true. Because uh, if he isn't there, it, it, at that particular moment, you don't know how long you're going to survive. And the thing of it is that you're going through uh, uh, not only the training, but uh, when it comes to combat, uh, uh, you're both, uh, it, it's, well, I'm going to say suffering, but uh, the thing of it is you, uh, the activity, uh, you can't really describe the feeling it is 
uh, to know that uh, your buddy's there. The only problem is with that uh, when you do lose a buddy, uh, it, it's, it's real severe. It, it uh, really gets to you. In fact, uh, I lost a, uh, a very close friend that I've uh, been with uh, all, the all through uh, training in uh, the uh, Airborne uh, on Christmas Day in uh, the Battle of Bugs. And uh, needless to say, uh, I don't know, remember, but the, uh, uh, my sergeant and other stuff told me afterwards I, I basically went berserk for like for two days. And uh, a machine gun was firing at us, and uh, I have, uh, carried a machine gun, but it was a modified one that the Airborne had. Uh, you could carry it and fire it at the same time. And I took that and crossed an open field and uh, eliminated uh, a machine gun uh, without ever remember doing it. And uh, uh, nobody could qu quite figure out how I survived. Because uh, uh, I found out later that um, you had what's called a jumpsuit, uh, parachute uniform, and it was uh, riddled with holes, but I didn't have a hole, didn't, had never been touched. But that night, uh, they said, okay, we're going. It was about midnight, and we walked down along the river. So we got down to these place where they had these landing barges waiting for us to cross the river. And uh, they were landing barges, the ones they use at Normandy. And maybe 20, 15 or 20 of us got in them. We were going to cross the river. Of course, being in the mortars, you're not the first to cross. The rifle troops go first, but we went over at midnight, one o'clock. So now daylight is coming on, and I was called up to the, uh, to the, to the command post, and the uh, lieutenant was there, and he, he got three of us men. One had a radio, and, and another fellow myself, and uh, he said, okay, follow me. So we went on a patrol up over the Rhine River of the bank. It took us half an hour to get up there. That day there was, there was not a boat in sight. Very quiet. So we said, okay, let's go now. So we started going back up the hill, creeping and crawling on our knees. Well, we didn't find anything. So we said, okay, let's go back. So going back, all of a sudden, this machine gun opened up on us. It was our own troops coming up the hill the same way we came up, and they were shooting at us. We were very lucky to, we were on the edge of a precipice. We were able to jump over and hide and, and be behind that precipice. Finally, after yelling at them and screaming who we were, they let us up and uh, they had that gun set up. It was no further from home plate to second base. Luckily, they were shooting over our heads. From the bulge, of course, our division was pulled back and sent it back to the Roar River where we were before to cross over. But the night before we were going to cross, the whole sky behind us lit up like on the 4th of July. Place is light, almost like daylight. There's so many guns going off, and where the shells were landing across the river, it was like daylight over there too because the shell, so many shells exploding. When we got to the river, we had no trouble going across because there's no one there to meet us because I guess the old shells and mortars or whatever went off took care of what they had to begin with. But going a mile or so from the river, then we started hitting a lot of Germans again. And from there, of course, we traveled through Germany and didn't have a too bad a time going because the Germans were just fleeing. And we used to leave pockets behind where we used to mop up after from some other division. And we ended up at Magdeburg, about 30 miles from Berlin. We stayed there. After a couple of days, the Germans were flooding across the river the Elbe River. They were surrendering to us, hundreds at a time. 
we had a pretty good job putting them on trucks and sending them back to the rear. And they were happy. They were getting away from the, from the Russians. Of course, they knew what the Russians would do to them. They would just shoot them. So they were happy they were coming back to us. And a after we met the Russians, shook hands and everything else, we came back to our own outfit. And then they were going to notice that we are going to like to be an occupation troop, so they sent us a further part of Germany up in the mountains, where we stayed there for about a week or so. And we got to notice that we're going to have training all over again. <laughs> They're going to give us training, marching, and doing all different things that the Army does. They had a parade, uh, the division had a parade for the generals. Then we were told that we're going back to the sea, get on the boats over in La Havre, France. And while we were on the boats, they said we were going to Japan. The look on everybody's faces it looked as though they were all about ready to cry. They were all sad looking, yelling about going to Japan. We had already been to Europe, already fought one war. Why would we go over for another one? But they said we had to go. And of course, the way the Japanese were before they stopped the bomb, threw the bomb down, they weren't going to give up. And if we went ashore in Japan, a lot of us I know weren't coming home. We weren't going to go home. No. We were about halfway across the ocean. We got notice that Japan had surrendered. This was in August. That Japan had surrendered and we're going home. So we turned around and came back to Boston. The, the war ended for me. Uh, we was about the Elbe River, and we'd uh, just liberated a concentration camp. Even after all the things you've seen, you couldn't believe that th this was even worse than I, I could ever imagine that uh, anybody could do to another human being. But uh, after that, uh, the, yeah, of course, the war ended for us uh, May, May, May 8th, and we was up what they call above the Elbe River. And we uh, had the whole German army uh, surrendered to the uh, 504th Regiment. So, but uh, as soon as that, that was over with, uh, uh, my unit was uh, assigned to uh, Berlin on occupation. So I went to Berlin. And here again, you've, you've been fighting, you've seen all this uh, disasters and all the atrocities that took place. But I still had, uh, had feelings in my heart uh, for the people, that what they had to go through, all the bombings and the Russian uh, shelling and the brutality the Russians uh, imposed on them before we got there. And uh, you couldn't imagine just how could anybody live there was no running water, there was no electricity, uh, where did you get the food? And uh, in one particular case, I'd only been there about three, four days, and uh, I was going to what they call an outpost uh, on guard, and this young woman was standing there with a uh, child. Was, both of them looked, you know, totally filthy because what else can you have? In perfect English, she says, would you have a candy bar to, for the baby? Well, since I didn't smoke, I used to trade the cigarettes for candy bars. So I gave her a candy bar, and while standing there looking at her, I said, what could you do with a pack of cigarettes? A pack of cigarettes were worth $200 in Allied fund money at that time. And she turned around and started crying and said, I can't pay you for it. I said, didn't ask you. So I gave her the candy bar and I gave her a pack of cigarettes. Maybe a week later, I'm still on my way out the outpost in a, one of the most gorgeous blondes you want to ever see and a beautiful child. She called a soldier. I turned around and looked. She started laughing. She says, I'm the same dirty woman that you saw last week. She had used that cig those cigarettes to bribe somebody to give her soap. You know, where she got the water, I don't know where it was, but 
she had cleaned up, her clothes was clean and everything else. But it was something that I always remembered uh, doing that made me feel good. Because uh, uh, when I looked at her, I was seeing my wife and I said, I couldn't be my child if, it was, if things had been reversed, you know, part of it. But I, I figured uh, she might have been my enemy uh, months earlier, but uh, I wasn't going to uh, impose on it now. <laughs>